Thank you for joining this session. Um, my name is Adeolu Adekola. I'm, I'm the one who is going to be chairing this session. And like you know, the session is um, dedicated to how to use data to investigate climate change. Um, I'm the program manager for the CIJ's Open Climate Reporting Initiative, OCRI. And of course, over the past one day thereabout, you've heard one or two things about OCRI, so I'm not going to go about you know, telling you about that. But essentially, what the CIJ has been doing with the OCRI program is to um, walk in different regions um, to try to interrogate the issues on environmental and climate reporting um, and also leveraging collaboration, cross-border investigations, and so on and so forth. Um, in the year one of the project, we worked in three regions, Latin America, excluding Brazil, um, Anglophone Africa, and Francophone Africa. Um, this year, we are currently working in Brazil and Lusophone Africa, uh, Middle East and North Africa, as well as, what's the last, South Asia, right? So we've been able to cover about 38 countries in the last 18 months. We'll be adding close to another 15 countries this year. Um, however, this conversation today is also based on the fact that we have seen over time that the subject of climate change has you know, generated a lot of divides, sometimes misinformation, disinformation. And so it's very important that when reporting climate change, it's very crucial to establish facts. And data is one of the ways that you use to establish facts as, as a journalist. And so I have with me on this panel, I mean, I, I called it a, an intercontinental cross-border conversation on climate change reporting. Um, we have Michelle, um, who is from Cameroon, who will be talking about, uh, you know, we are going to be using stories um, as case studies to interrogate how um, data can be used. So Michelle is a journalist from Cameroon who worked with the CIJ on Okri, um, was trained and also did a report that interrogated the disappearance of mangroves in Cameroon. Um, she's going to be talking about that story. We have Basant um, from Nepal, who is also a journalist from Nepal, and Aaron. Aaron is the executive director of Center for Data Journalism Nepal. We, so before we kick started OCRI in year one, we worked with Aaron's organization in ne Nepal as a pilot phase. Um, so he kind of like, his organization oversaw the intervention working with Basant. So they are also going to be talking about a story that interrogated um, the used data, satellite imagery mapping, and so on and so forth, GIS or GSI. So he's going to be speaking on that. Last but not least is Yuan Luca. Um, he is a journalist with Radar Magazine. Um, um, he's a science journalist, um, and it's also very important because um, the conversation of climate change has a science layer to it, just like COVID-19. Uh, and so he's also going to be talking about a, a story um, he did and the tools and techniques he used, um, especially using data um, in that aspect. Um, of course, the, the story was done with um, the partnership of Journalism Fund, who funded that story. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, we, so we're going to start the conversation right away. and. Everyone is going to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes to talk about their story, and then we'll come back to take one or two questions, and then we throw it to the audience. So, Michelle, you're, you're up first. Good morning to, to you all. Um, as he said, I'm Michelle, Michelle Ibongi. I'm a journalist, and I'm a Cameroonian. I will please um, or I will ask everyone here to be present with my English because I'm a French speaker and I know that um, my language, you have, you have already known that because of my way of speaking in English so that and if uh, our investigation is part of what have we call um, data journalism academies uh, and we're talking about um, um, a Vuru estuary in the mangrove. Vuru estuary is in, um, is in Cameroon, 
is a part of Cameroon and year of uh, Douala, the um, economic capital of Cameroon. Uh, it was about what we have called um, Open Data for Environment and Civic Awareness in Cameroon, a project investigation of a disappearance of mangrove at the Vuri estuary in Cameroon, as I said at the beginning. Uh, in Bonaberry, about 31% of mangroves have been lost in five years. Bonaberry is a city of Cameroon um, in Douala. Uh, it is the most popular uh, city in, the, in Cameroon. It is based on um, in uh, Douala 40, 40 uh, Douala 4 um, district. Uh, it is the most, as I said, popular district in the, in the town. It was a teamwork. I was not the, the, uh, the only journalist who uh, read the, the story. Um, and the story, um, the, real, the realization of the story made us seven months. Uh, it was being publicated to uh, print and online media. And Data Cameroon, uh, it is the major with whom um, I, I, work with, I work with. And Douala today, and Le Jou, it is the it is major with um, uh, with whom the um, uh, my colleague Machas work with. So those are our photos or our, our pictures. Um, about methodolo methodological um, approach, um, firstly we draw up a, a work plan and um, an editorial sheet to better structure and organize our, our, work, our work by using uh, Google Sheets and Google Doc. I know that those who were at the session of uh, data journalism uh, still um, since yesterday, they have already um, knows what is uh, Google Sheet and, and Google Doc. Um, it was uh, equally about um, documentary research uh, through um, uh, not only internet, but to uh, any other um, literature that we, we had, uh, I mean reports, articles, um, useful co co contacts uh, equally, places to, to explore. Uh, we have all, um, also field uh, visit interviews with administrative and lo lo local authorities, um, NGOs equally. We equally use um, document and, and data, use of verification tools like Global Forest Watch, uh, Flourish, uh, Google Earth. Global, Global Forest Watch is, um, is a tool which allows us to, to know where uh, our mangrove, uh, mangrove are situated. So you don't have to, you have to know where, where they are so that you can know now where you can go to the field. You will not only um, uh, go to somewhere or go to some town, town, city, and say that, okay, I will just check if there is a mangrove there. You have firstly to, to, to look at it on, on, um, on Global Forest Watch, so you will know exactly where are those, those mangroves. Um, Flourish was about make, um, how do we say graphics? Because you maybe you you will have a, um, automatic automatically data and and the um, the good how do we say it again? And if you have data, you have to make to make graphics so that things have to be um, I don't want to say organized but more uh, realized. For those who doesn't know what is um, what our mangrove talk about, mangroves is a tropical coastal formation based on mangrove trees and a rich fauna, uh, which colonize the muddy deposit of estuary or, or legons, lagoons. It is made up of trees capable to withstand the both water and salt. And about uh, sunny ground, it is aquatic area where fish are. Um, and amphibians, equally extension, mollusks are 
reproduced. When we are talking about carbon sink, it is um, a reservoir that absorbs carbon from the carbon cycle. Okay, let us talk now about the, about the investigation. Um, of the estimated 1% annual loss, a loss of mangrove in Cameroon, the sorry, um, the very sorry, as I said, the mangrove area around around Douala is the most decimated. So it is losing 2.6.2% uh, a year. So 31% over the last five years in the Douala Bonaberry area. And here everyone has a local population. Uh, um, responsible of this of this la loss of, of mangrove. So um, um, we have in, in Cameroon what we call um, anglophone crisis, and we have people who live at the southwest, uh, southwest region that come to the Litwa region because because um, Bonaberry it is situated in the Litwa region and they are very around. But they, they, they come to the Ritua because they, they, they are, um, uh, how do we say it? They are running away the crisis which is in, uh, on the southwest region. And usually they doesn't, know, doesn't have a place uh, to live. And what they have is like, now we, we are searching a place and maybe you have your, a member of your family there and the member will tell you that, hey, come on, come uh, with me. I have a place, I have some town. You two can buy uh, a field, a compound there. They don't know really what, uh, what are those compounds. They don't say, okay, I will have somewhere to, to, stay, to stay so that me too, I will have my own, my own house, my own compound. And because it is around, they just live at the uh, mangrove area. As I said, uh, Bonaberry's uh, proximity to the southwest region. Okay, during our, our investigation, we look at um, NGOs uh, such as Water Shitask, um, which, uh, which is working to reforest uh, graduated mangrove in the fourth um, arrondissement of Douala. Surely it is uh, their rule, but when we, we talked with them, it was like, this is what we want to do, but really there are um, some, uh, some quarters that, um, that are not really what we, um, when we are going to, to uh, how do you say it? to replant a, man a mangrove because, uh, you know, now when you say, when you go, you go, you will go there, you, you surely so say, um, see uh, mangrove trees, um, a, even uh, animals, but in other quarter you will not, or other city will not see those, um, uh, those animals or those animals or those, uh, or those plants. So um, it was like uh, area with, um, where, area where we were, area where we were um, searching, I mean, uh, in Bonaberry, we have uh, Mabanda, we have Bonabome. Uh, those area were not um, selected by that NGOs. It was really uh, complicated. And um, surely, um, uh, authorities, uh, we have law. And law doesn't um, allow people to, um, to build even house on a mangrove area, but that law is not really um, um, how do we say it or how can I say it? You know, it is in English. Sorry. Enforced. Enforced. Thank you for the word. <laughs> okay. 
So, but they doesn't really realize that what they have to do is that um, they have to, um, uh, to, to make away those people, but they said that if you don't, if you, you we, we, we realize that, so where those people were, were live, they are living the crisis now, if even here, the abang uh, we we as um, uh, local or administrative authority, we also abandon them. Where can can they live again? Mm. So that's why I think. And during our investigation, we realized that um, um, mangrove area at that part of Douala or at that part of the city will not really be. Um, uh, readapted because of all those all those things equally we have um, uh, equally we have uh, some um, uh, infrastructure infrastructure that have been made by um, administrative um, authorities the law is there yes but if um, those who are make, making those law even doesn't respect it. I don't know who can respect it. It's not a simple population or but just um, uh, people who want to to have a house or to to be somewhere to live somewhere who will um, uh, realize or will respect those those laws. And now we, want, we are going to talk about our professional contributions. Um, it was about the need of start and investigation with documentary research. As I said at the beginning, um, the contribution of academies of to data collection have a work plan and an editorial sheet to better structure and organize our work, find out if there, there is a work similar to, to ours and in order to think about or contribute new new elements, better knowledge of the mangrove ecosystem, indeed. Use of documents <coughs> and, um, and data, more rigor and respect for deadlines. As I said, we were two. So, and maybe we, were, we, we are colleagues, but we don't work at the same, at the same media. So, uh, surely when um, he was abroad, and me here, I'm sorry, I'm not in Cameroon, of course. I'm in London. <laughs> when he was abroad and not me, it was like, now what can we do? We have to go there and you have to do this, but you, you cannot because you are not um, in country. So it was those things uh, or what I would call some difficulties that we had during our, our investigation. Uh, more rigor and respect of that lad, as I said, use of document and, and data. Difficulties, rejection of certain sources. Mm -hmm. We have sources that we, we made or we, 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 meet, we met, yes, we met uh, when we were at the field. They said, yes, um, we, we gave you some documents, we have this, 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 and after that, the person doesn't respond to, to your call when you call uh, the local administration, he doesn't want to respond. He said that, oh, if you come to get again, uh, maybe tomorrow, uh, I, will not, um, um, uh, I will not answer you. I don't want you again, again. It was like, what is going on? Right. It is only uh, information that, that, that we want. Ah, I forgot about internet or networking. It was not easy at all, you know. I don't know um, here in London, but in Cameroon it's not easy at all when you want to to to, uh, to work with internet. So you have um, uh, to me uh, you have to to work early in the morning by three or two if you want to to really work with internet. Uh, fan area and data specific uh, to Cameroon on global forest wash. It was. It was uh, not easy again because we doesn't really like have um, informations about about Cameroon. You know, you can have informations about um, Europeans or Americans, um, 
um, informations. But now when we talk about African information or Cameroonian information through these uh, tools, it's like Cameroon doesn't exist. Sorry, my, pay, my, my country exists, of yeah, course, but it's know, like... I <laughs> Sorry, I, I will have to stop you there. But that basically also speaks to access to information. Um, so, of course, I, I would have a question to ask along those lines, for example, on how how effective is freedom of information in Cameroon, so on and so forth. Um, but thank you very much, Michelle. We, we are going to come back to you. Thank so I would you. like to move to Basant now, um, who will start the conversation on the Nepal story. Um, and Aaron will also take over from him. Basant. Okay. We, Aaron and me, are going to share about the story. Which we did last year in Nepal under the Orchid project. The story is about the 125 schools from a district in far western part of Nepal that are at the high risk of floods and landslides where 20,000 plus students study. This story was taken by Kantipur National Delhi in local language and it's English person was also published in Kathmandu Post. Both of, both of the outlets are leading publication in Nepal, uh, reaching millions of readers every day. Before we did this story, a photo went viral on the social platform three years ago. It was standing between two landslides on either side of the schools building and was affected by landslide. It was in such a vulnerable condition, but uh, I learned that despite the situation, students were studying in the same building. When I saw the photo, I become so curious to know if other schools in Bajang district were facing similar conditions. Hmm. But it was made me confused about how to report and tell a story because it is impossible to visit all area mm. due to hostile geographical condition. Moreover, schools are loca located randomly in hilly area across the district. At the same time, I attended CDJ and Center for Data Journalism Data Journalism Net Nepal training got the opportunity to learn open source research tools and mapping. I was able to analyze satellite imagery to find the situation of e schools. When I started collecting data on e schools, unfortunately, no data was available in the uh, local and district authority. Even no research has been done on it. So I sent application to the district education development and coordination office through right to information, which is uh, similar to Freedom of Information Act. We got data in paper-based format from 12 municipality offices. The citizen was able to make them digital and geolocate every point of school on the map during the visit. I observed the magnitude of vulnerability and realized how big the problem is. I interviewed many students, teachers, guardians, and local authority during that time. After completing ground level reporting uh, and verification, I find out uh, out of the 300, 120 schools are at risk of landslides and floods. These are the e schools where 20,000 plus students study. You know, Nepal is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. However, one of the, one, the other hand, I also discovered the haphazard road construction work is another key factor is actually triggering landslide is many parts of Western Nepal. A few months after, the story were published. 
it drew serious attention of local, provincial and federal government because such stories were not reported by anyone apart from a few incidents. Recently, even the budget has been allocated from a special president school reform program for a relocation and rebuilding of a school in Nepal. We have been receiving news from our source that many local governments, uh, also provincial government, have started the re relocation of a school and currently applying necessary mitigation measures to protect the building from landslide and floods. I think Arun wants more, explain more. Thank you. Please, Arun, over to you. Thank you, Basim. So, um, let me just open my slide. So, as Basanta already explained, you know, uh, how uh, he learned about like, uh, 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 like 125 schools that are at high risk of landslides and floods, which was not known before, you know, except uh, uh, except uh, for some incidents that were reported by you know local media outlets, so we examined uh, 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 like the it, it we examined to see the magnitude of the problem, and uh, and which was uh, and that was all started from a photo. You see, any the many people you know in other countries know Nepal is the country of Mount Everest. So at the same time, it is also one of the most vulnerable country due to climate change, and uh, the incidents uh, have affected very badly in recent years uh, than before. So this is like, uh, as you can see here, the circle indicates the is the capital Kathmandu. I mean, this place is uh, somewhat accessible, and but you see uh, in the western part of Nepal, so this is one of the schools that Basanta was talking about that he mentioned where like 236 students still study. So this is, uh, this is where the story started. So uh, which is like uh, uh, 1,200 kilometers, uh, kilometers away from the Kathmandu, capital Kathmandu, and it is located in the hilly part of Nepal. So if you tilt the map, you will see this is the district of Bazang where you know, Basanta is based in. And, this is, and you can see the point, I have been pointed uh, the Bhumi De Basic School. So this is the place, uh, and, and and the area you know the uh, you know uh, uh, area with the yellow line is the Bajang district, and to the north you can see the Himalayas, like uh, bordering Tibet. So if uh, you have a closer, if this is a, a, a bit closer look of the, that school, and uh, again this is the school where you can see the uh, landslide you know triggered by the road construction newly. Uh, new, newly, you know, constructed road, uh, which has triggered landslide, and it has badly affected the school classroom like this. So, you see the muddy classroom where the students uh, are not able to study. So, this is how you know such disasters affect classes in Nepal, and the students are you know compelled to you know uh, study outside. As you can see, the students are you know having their classes in open air. Like uh, these are the you know cases from two different schools in Bajang. And uh, well when it comes to you know, applying the process uh, to do this story, uh, this is how we gather data. This is like the, we, this is how you know, we, uh, collect, uh, we collect data from the local municipalities, as Basant already mentioned, and it comes in all paper based, and we have to you know, make it you know, machine readable so that we will be able to like uh, create maps and geolocate all the points, you know, by taking, you know, uh, help of so many, you know, local sources and by uh, like the ground level verifications because Basant also, you know, visited, you know, so many municipalities, you know, and it took around like uh, uh, more than a month. Uh, so this is how, you know, you con converted the paper-based data uh, to uh, into a Google sheet, Google spreadsheet. and. We were able to also geolocate and or georeference the location of schools, and that's how we built this map. And uh, uh, as you can see, the points they are all located, you know, nearby the riverside or in the hilly areas, which are pretty, you know, I mean, hostile. 
So uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the screenshots of the uh, stories, uh, both published in English and Nepali language, and the Kantipur National Daily and uh, the Kathmandu Post, which are considered to be the leading uh, daily brochures in, in in Nepal, and you know reaching out to millions of uh, uh, readers, you know. Uh, and we also try to see who is responsible for this. So uh, there is this environmental crime going on uh, by these uh, polit uh, by these you know uh, uh, construction companies, you know, backed by politicians, where the politicians themselves, the mainly the local politicians, politicians themselves are involved, you know, in constructing such roads without you know doing any environmental assessment. So these are the one of the key factors which are triggering landslide and making the lives of the students, you know. Uh, very vulnerable, and uh, after some time, after a few 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 months, so as Basant said, like uh, the government uh, has if, uh, the the three tier government, you know, started you know you know paying their attention and trying to you know uh, allocate budget for relocation, rebuilding, and mitigation. So this is the uh, uh, one one of the schools, uh, basic schools that is being uh, constructed in a. Uh, a safer place. So this is the impact we are having, and like, uh, and I, uh, and I want to show like this is uh, uh, not the case of one school. As you can see, uh, the built two buildings, uh, mm, one of the schools from the Bajang. So if you want to zoom out, you will see like how that school is located here. As you can see here. So I mean, many other schools are you know in in vulnerable conditions, yeah. and uh, you see. So landslide, uh, landslides are affecting you know schools and uh, other buildings. So people are living in very vulnerable conditions. So one of the process that I want to see that we have used to analyze and compare the data is Google Earth Pro, where uh, where I want to show which uh, we found out later because the satellite imagery was not updated by Google when we did this story. So this is the this is this is the school. So as you as, as you tilt this, this is where the school is located, and to the north, to the north you see you see you see mountains, and there is another school, so which is. Uh, it's Jagadamba Basic School that was also badly damaged by the 2021 flood. Okay. So I just want to show you the comparison, how we did the comparison. So this is uh, a tilted view, and let me do a, you know, bird eyes view and show how flood actually swept ev swept away the large section of uh, the building, uh, the buildings, including the school building. So you see, this is uh, already the flood affected area. As you see the orange line, this is the line where the flood has reached. And you see the circle where the school is located. So back in uh, 2021, you see there are the buildings and see how you know, the area is you know, affected by the flood. And we use uh, this Google Earth Pro tool, a tool extensively even you know, to measure the length, area, and everything, you know, just to be more specific, you know, uh, more precise in our reporting. So, and uh, it has become very helpful. And this is what we taught during our training last year uh, in in Kathmandu. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, and I and I find it interesting because I mean, I also think that's also part of the lesson um, from what I picked. So it was, I mean, this story was published, I think, around sometime in November, October, October last year. October. October. Yeah. Um, but it was when I was having a conversation with them, just when they came into the UK, I got the information that there was a budget allocation by the government, and then there was a program for school relocation. Uh, and, and so that also speaks to the fact that sometimes it's not just enough to do a story. And I also find it interesting, for example, um, I, I don't know if anybody was here during Fisayo's keynote yesterday. Sometimes it's just an observation you have 
um, maybe in your locality as a journalist or so for him he saw his school on a hill affected by landslide he was a bit concerned and what was established was that in that district there were a lot of schools right um, out of 300 schools nearly half were affected so that became a serious concern for him um, but now we are going to move to Jan Luca who is going to share with us the forever pollution project <laughs> thank you thank you <coughs> hi everyone I am Jan Luca Liva a science journalist from Italy and uh, part of the group of founders of the Forever Pollution Project. The Forever Pollution Project started at the end of 2021 thanks to a little group of journalists, Stefano Rell, Bailemond, Tim Luimas, me and Sarah Pils from Germany. After starting working on our project at the end of 2022, we decided to scalate the project involving Arena for Journalism, who contacted several other newsrooms around Europe. And this project uh, was possible to do this project thanks to the support of uh, Journalist Fund, IJ4AU and the International Press Institute. And the project was about the poly and perfluoroalkylic substances. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they are a, a, an absurd and abnormal class of substances and we use them every day, in basically in everything. They were discovered randomly in 1939 in the US while uh, looking for a new uh, refrigerating gas. And uh, starting from the beginning of the 50s of the last century, we started using them in food package, cars, mobiles, uh, everything that is uh, non-sticky, everything that is uh, waterproof, like uh, our dresses, uh, like uh, or stuff like uh, ski waxes or fight fighting foams or pizza boxes. Okay, mm -hmm. they are literally everywhere. Okay, how many PFAS are there? We don't know. Ten years ago, the scientists uh, estimated there were uh, 4,730. Then this number became, uh, became uh, 10,000, then 23,000, then 1 million. And nowadays, according to the last update of the PubChem database, they are more than 10 millions. And we know the inner characteristic of uh, like uh, 20 of them. Sorry, please. Are you saying there are 10,000 different molecules that fall into these categories? No, no, uh, more than 10 million. Oh, 10 million, but I mean you're saying different molecules? Yeah, Instantly. yeah, yeah, different molecules, okay. yeah. With some, a lot of times with slight differences. Yes, slight differences, And uh, yeah. it's one of the steps uh, where the corporation try to do their of things, course. okay? The, we call them the regrettable substitutions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I will talk about them later. So, <coughs> Their wonderful and hyper-useful characteristics led them to be used in everything. They are persistent, okay, and that's why they are called uh, forever chemicals. They are ubiquitous, they are everywhere, okay, in the environment, in my blood, in your blood, okay, and uh, they, they got the ability to move fast in the environment, in soil, in water, in the air, as aerosols, okay? And uh, since the beginning of, the, of, the, of this century, we discover that they can have uh, serious, some serious consequences for our health, okay? We will talk later about uh, the correlation causation uh, knowledge that we had right now about PFAS. So we decided to try to look for where this contamination is in Europe. We know about uh, two peculiar cases in Italy, in the Veneto region, near Venice, and uh, in the Netherlands, uh, near Dordrecht, a city in the Netherlands. 
at the beginning, we had to, as I was saying, we had to understand uh, what PFAS are and how many of them there are outside. So we started building this uh, comparison tool. As you can see, there is the big family of PFAS substances and then the subsets, okay? The perfluoroalkyl acids, okay? And then an other subgroups uh, till going down to the single singular molecule, like the infamous PFOA or the PFOS, uh, aka the uh, perfluoroalkylid acids again, but uh, I keep being confused by uh, these formulas and, uh, you know, brute formulas and the CAS numbers mm -hmm. and so on and so on. <coughs> anyway, after understanding how was organized by now the PFAS family, we decided to build a map. Whoa. We, took, we took expedition by a US map. Okay. Uh, some scientists in the US already provided a US map of PFAS contamination. We get inspiration, we contacted them, and we started working together with the top scientists in the recognized top scientists in the world on this particular topic. And we build a methodology for the map. You can check the entire methodology on a website named foreverpollution.eu. Okay? And we started collecting data. Everyone from uh, his or her own country. For example, I collected data from Italy and Portugal. My French colleague collected data from France and Sweden, and so on and so on. And uh, you can see here the index of our data sets collected during the time. Dozen and dozen and dozen of regional data sets for every region in Italy, for example, for every region in Germany. As you can see, I recorded an example about uh, a sub, 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 subset of data from the, um, a particular region in Italy, and here they are. Sampling locations, geolocalization, longitude, latitude, data, uh, date of sampling, metrics, groundwater, surface water, biota, soil, air, and the results for every singular substance. Okay? Yeah, I, I, uh, I lost a lot of eyesight, mm -hmm. okay, working <laughs> on this. Okay? And uh, at the end, uh, thanks to our data angels uh, by Le Monde, we were able to build the first ever map of uh, the PFAS pollution in Europe. Divided in known users, known contamination. Users, presumptive sites of contamination. We decided, as you can see, users and presumptive contamination. What does it mean, presumptive? Airports, industrial sites, um, military sites and uh, uh, facility for training for the firefighters using PFAS firefighting forms. I, I zoom on uh, Vienna, you know, to give you just an example of the level of detail. As you can see, surface water 2008. I chose Vienna because my little sister lives there, so, okay. Results of our uh, project. We spotted 20 PFAS producing facilities. More than 17,000 known contamination sites organized in our map in more than 2,200 hotspot clusters because a lot of sampling points were pretty near with each other, okay? And the map uh, could be confusing. And more than 21,000 presumptive contamination sites according to our subgroup division on industrial sites, waste man management sites, and so on and 231 PFAS users. Facilities that, da that uh, don't produce PFAS, but use PFAS. 
and the results uh, was uh, uh, at the moment, at the end of May, 75 publications around Europe mm. with all our colleagues. And one site uh, built by Arena for Journalism, as I was saying, called the Forev foreverpollution.eu. The project is still going on and on. There will be some other publication during the summer, some other investigation during the, uh, the autumn, and uh, we don't know if this project will ever have will ever had have, uh, has a con have a conclusion. What else? Every partner did his uh, or her own uh, investigation. Everyone around Europe, when uh, while seeing the map, at first everyone is looking at uh, his uh, city or his, uh, or his or her village, okay? The place where you live. You go immediately to check where you live. And uh, this provoked a waterfall of local and regional publication. Starting doing their own investigation thanks to our project. And maybe also you can start doing a regional or local investigation thanks to this map. We don't know what's on the spot. We just, you know, put the spot on the map. But it's up to you to start investigating the single points. One last key concept. Okay. The map shows what has been sampled in Europe, but it doesn't show what it is, what the contamination actually is. You know, the human being uh, is not perfect in uh, its activities. Okay, so this is what uh, the human being collected about PFAS in Europe, but for sure it is not uh, the real contamination. Super last thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I also did uh, a, a scientific overview on Le Scienze, the Italian edition of Scientific American. That's what we know in Europe. The, the scientific studies in Africa are four. The scientific studies in Latin America are, are 12. Okay. We are in front of a huge problem. Maybe someone is doing some comparison with asbestos, but uh, it's completely different. Mm. And we collected a lot of stories, a lot of stories. Like uh, you can see a um, plant in Italy. I, uh, to take this picture, I was lying on the mud, on the frozen mud at the end of December, trying to be not spotted by the company rangers driving across the plant uh, with their uniform, with a star badge, like, you know, the US police uh, officers. And, uh, you know, covered in mud, black dressed, we managed, thanks to my partner in crime, Elisabetta, to took this uh, picture of the fumes uh, of this factory. Uh, but that's another story, and I got tons of other stories about the uh, survey rangers following me okay, during my investigation. Sorry, and thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The first question. Every national and regional agency in Europe uh, is working in a different way. There is no harmonization. Okay, so for example, the Italian ARPA is working uh, especially on um, groundwater. Okay, sometimes on surface water, sometimes on soil. In, different re in one region, they collect data on air. In Sicily, not. And the same thing uh, happens uh, in, the, in all the other European countries. So, uh, but really, check the methodology on the website. Uh, it's 32 pages long. Okay. <sighs> we decided to put everything on the map. And uh, if you check every spot, uh, you will see that uh, is uh, indicated the metrics like biota, air, surface water, and so on. So we decided basically to keep everything but describing it. 
and I keep saying that uh, there is, there was, and there is no harmonization in the European data. That was the problem for us, the real problem. To try, you know, to find a, <laughs> a common standard. Mm. Okay. Your second question about Robert Billot, yes, we interviewed them and we already published uh, uh, the first interview and I was lucky because uh, Robert Billot was in Italy recently and we, um, we slept together in the same uh, B&B uh, with uh, a photographer, Robert Billot, and me. And you know, we, were, uh, we spent uh, one wonderful week uh, visiting some Italian villas around and uh, eating salami and vegetables. And I did this uh, seven days long interview, okay? <laughs> and I will publish it uh, at the end of August. And uh, if you want, uh, I will share it with you. He's wonderful, an amazing person, so gentle. Uh, he was in Italy to attend, uh, to, uh, to be listened by, uh, in a court, uh, by a judge. I was there and there was an interpreter from English to Italian, okay, a translator. The process started, the interrogation started, and it was uh, crystal clear since the beginning that the translator was not able to translate, <laughs> okay? Yeah, really, because uh, she was uh, a 19 years old girl, okay, nominated by the secretary of the judge who accepted the suggestion of the defense lawyers. Okay, so again, the corporation were able to slow down and slow down and slow down the process. Okay, I mean, uh, it's possible in Italy, I suppose, I don't know in your country, but uh, yeah. in my country, we can have uh, also a talk uh, to later about it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we, we, we'll be wrapping up. We have about just two minutes. So for you, Aaron and Basant, um, just quickly, um, from your experience, do you have, what, what would you say is, what, what advice or tip can you give to make a climate change story interesting to read, right? So for example, you have said something about PFAs and all that, and then there are opportunities to, you know, interrogate locally. But in your own words, one minute, what, what would you say is that one thing, you know, when reporting a story on climate change? Thank you, Ariel. I think uh, as uh, this organization called Isimod is uh, doing research on HKH, Hindukus Himalayan region, so they're trying to see how the snow in this region is uh, you know melting like every year mm. and in 90 years like the snow will be finished mm. and at the same time the problem of glough like glacial lake outburst flood mm. so that problem is also like uh, posing a threat to not only in nepal but in bhutan uh, but in pakistan but in india like there are like uh, this Himalayan region provinces called Arunachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and you see the region where the conflict is going on between this Jammu and Kashmir. Mm. So there are the high risk of glove, and all these uh, like the risk or the scenarios could affect the communities downstream. So I think it is going to affect the millions of people um, in this region, in, in, in the South Asia region. So I think. Uh, like like this forever pollution project if this story the, the, this sort of stories can be done in collaboration between these south asian countries it is really going to like create awareness and also you know seeking like uh, seeking some sort of like a uh, uh, what you say it could campaign in front of other countries european countries like how you know global global warming is mm -hmm. affecting the countries uh, in south asia Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally for you, um, Michelle. So I, I know your story, there, was, there were multiple layers to your story. And part of what your story also established is that there was actually a 
reforestation project, right, by the government that was identified. Um, have you, do you think you can follow up on that project? What has happened about it? Um, to perhaps just dig further, especially in the light of holding power to account. Okay, about um, reforestation, we, we talk about it um, to um, our look, um, not our local, but um, authorities, administrative authorities, and after looking at photos, because I ran there with photos that I made or that we made during our, um, our investigative, and after that they said that really um, we have to do something there. But because it is like we 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 firstly have to to write to write it down after look at what we have to do. So because we are already uh, on the year, we will look at it at the, the next year. So the next year we will now um, look at how we can do, maybe um, we have already uh, think about uh, the city or the, or the, the quarter. Now we will, we will look about um, reforestation about those, um, those parts of the, of the city. I mean uh, that uh, Bonaberry area. So I, I think maybe, maybe um, we are going to make another or to make another investigation of what now um, are they doing for those reforestation. But what we know is that it is NGOs who made those, those kind of, of, of work, not uh, really uh, administrative authorities. Thank you. OK. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening and staying tuned. Um, we are done with the session, but the conversation keeps going because, I mean, like I've always said, um, the topic of the discussion of climate change is not just something that is, I mean, a school of thought has tried to misinform and disinform people about it. However, um, like I've said repeatedly, we have to deliberately, more or less, make the conversation about climate change, um, bring it to the front burner of different conversations. It intersects with health, it intersects with education, and so on and so forth. And just like COVID-19, um, as journalists, we should now actively demystify the conversation, um, the forever pollutant. What does it mean? How is it on your raincoat, how is it on your pizza box? How many pizza do you eat in a day? And so we have to break it down so that people are able to relate to it. Um, thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>